uh, we also have a distinguished Walter Durham partner. This is Glenda Milliken, and she was his secretary for 50 years and probably helped edit a lot of those little books mm -hmm. that we've been seeing. So. All. all of them. <laughs> all, all, all of them. Okay. See, you should, Kenneth, you should have just talked to her first. And I know. Okay. Yeah. She wasn't here, so she couldn't correct me. So okay. I'm okay. lucky. Tonight, we're going to hear from Judith Morgan. And here's Judith. She uh, taught at Galton High School for a while. Then she went to the state. Then she retired and started her real job. <laughs> she has written three books in three years. Langley Hall, and then Elmwood, and then Sumner County goes to World War One. And what she's going to do tonight is take us on that journey with the video. So she's going to uh, escort us right through here, and many of you will see things that are familiar. Are you going to talk about the four guys you talked about? Uh, yes. Okay. I don't know that I gave you the names. Well, the ones that were in the other lecture, the Harrison and... No. Okay. No, it's okay. totally different. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, okay. <laughs> I try very hard not ever to make the same talk twice because I tend to get people in the same group. And she heard me at Ball State last week, so she was asking me, am I going to take talk about the same four people? And I'm not. Um, so, and, and do you think... Number one, let me calm down and say what an honor it is to be here in honor of Walter Durham. Um, I will never forget that he had a draft of Langley Hall in his possession and had read the first section when he got so sick and called me and said, I am just not up to this. You'll have to find somebody else to edit it. And I know it would have been a better book. I hope it was a good book, but had his help not given out when it did. So I, he means a lot to all of us. So that's an honor just to be asked to be part of this series. So thank you very much for that. Um, I do try to make every talk different in case you hear me talk about the same topic somewhere else. There'll be a few things that are the same, but this one's going to be totally different from any other one that I've done. And I started to ask the question, can you see the screen well or do you think if we darken it, it would be? There may be a few slides as we go through. If you can't see, we can darken it temporarily. But let's just start. Um, so tonight, we're going to... Uh, talk about mainly the 30th division. You want to go to the next? And I'll explain that to you. Most of the time I try to give you a background of the war and what was going on in Gallatin and Sumner County when the war started, but I don't have time to do that tonight. So we're going to go straight to 1917 when the United States entered the war in April of 1917. We were totally unprepared. We had a very small standing army, regular army. We had a very small navy. We had a few marines. We were not ready to go to war. And we certainly didn't have enough men to take overseas to make a difference in that horrible bloodbath that had been going on since 1914. So immediately, we had to go into high gear to get war ready. And even though we entered the war in 1917, it would really be 1918 before we made any kind of a difference at all. We didn't have the men, we didn't have camps to train the men, and we did not have ships to take them overseas. And all of that had to be created very fast. So in May, Immediately after we joined the war, the Selective Service Act was passed. This is one of the legacies of what we now know as World War I, the Selective Service. And the day of registration was set <coughs> for June 5th. At the same time, the United States federalized all of the National Guard troops from all of the different states. Now, before 1916, they would not have been allowed to do that. 
But in 1916, when we thought we were going to war with Mexico and the president asked for the guard troops from the southeast to be sent to the Mexican border to protect the United States if we went to war with Mexico, the president had asked for the troops and Congress, I think knowing that eventually we were going to be in this war, had passed the law that allowed the president in a state of national emergency to federalize the what then were known as the militia, the state militias, and they were under the power of the governors. But beginning in 1916, national emergency, they can be federalized. So we had these two prongs happening at the same time, plus as soon as we declared war, people started uh, enlisting right and left. So go to the next one. So here we are. The men registered on the 5th of July, and they had to do that under threat of imprisonment. If they didn't, it was quite uh, severe. Um, and they went through the whole messy process, which any new federal law is when it's implemented very quickly, and even when it's not implemented quickly, it's usually a mess. So, um, they had, this was the first group of men from Sumner County who had been drafted and were ready to be sent to training camp. And they left Gallatin on September 21st of 1917. Now there are so many stories that I could tell you, but I only have a short time tonight. We had soldiers, black and white, we had soldiers, guardsmen, and draftees. We had sailors. We had marines. So I had to choose one particular topic tonight, and I thought you might enjoy this one. We're going to take a little sentimental journey through Gallatin a hundred years ago. Now I want you first to look at where those men are standing. They are standing, obviously, in front of the courthouse. But obviously it's not the courthouse we know <laughs> because that was 1917 and the courthouse we have was not built until the 1930s and it was a WPA project. So different courthouse. But if you will look to the back, you will see a building that is still there today. That was then called, I don't know if it still is, the Schamberger Building. It had been built by the Schamberger family, and it had been built in 1905. So it was not brand new, but fairly new. And if you go <coughs> all the way to the tail end of all those men, imagine where you are. You're looking down East Main Street. Go to the next one. That's where we are. <coughs> right now, where we are sitting is where that building stood. That was, at the time, called the Central High School. When I was growing up in Gallatin, of course, it was General Shoe, plant number one. But it was a fairly new building, not brand new, but a fairly new building in 1917. <coughs> All the draftees, the night before they had to leave, had to report there by 4 <coughs> o'clock or face imprisonment and they had to go through a process. They'd been told what they could bring with them. And the Red Cross put on a banquet for them. So they had met there, here, where we are, the night before. Now, what would they have seen if they walked out the front door of this building? If, if this building were still there. Go to the next one. Ready? All right. The Church of Christ across the street had just been built in 1914. Now this is a later picture obviously. The streets were not yet paved and we didn't have parking meters. But the church was there. So that's catty-cornered to the building, what you would have seen. But go up one more and across the street would have been the white garage. <coughs> And I know it was still there during World War I because Dr. Lackey, in one of the sources that I had, were the wonderful letters that Dr. Bill Lackey had written home that Ken Thompson had rescued from a shed <laughs> at some point. 
Um, and in one of those letters, he advises his wife, he's getting ready to come home, he advises his wife to go to the man who runs this garage to get advice on getting a car. So the white front garage was right across the street. So we've seen where we are, we've seen where the men are lined up. Let's back up a little and look down East Main Street. Now I think this picture was made about 1912, and I'll tell you why in a second. I want you to notice, if you can tell, I'll have to point out that right there. It wasn't a stoplight, I think it's a street light, just light. It's an electric light bulb hanging in the middle of the street. You look down the street and you can see, pardon me, I don't have a pointer, here we are, right there. If this, was this photograph was made around 1912, as I think it was, the church had not yet been built. So you're looking down the street, looking down East Main, you see the Schamberger building, and I want to take advantage of this. Obviously, this is a winter scene because there are no leaves on the trees. But as we talk about what we're talking about tonight, I want us always to remember that life did not happen in black and white. Go to the next one. <coughs> That's what East Main Street would have looked like in September of 1917. So let's remember it wasn't a black and white world. It was a color world living in dying color because they were going to war. So, go to the next one. Let's back up and look at the square. Now this was taken in 1912. Immediately you're going to notice something very different about that scene and the other picture we've seen of the square. What is it? The color of the building. The color of the building, right. It's a brick building. It's still brick here. By 1917 it's been painted. And I think it's white. In 1925, it will be repainted again, bright yellow, <laughs> with white and black trim. So that's one difference. But otherwise, the square is pretty, it's the same courthouse. You see the men were lined up right here. And you see the Schamberger building over there. So in a minute, they're lined up on the 21st of September. And with them are lined up an escort. The draft board is there to walk with them to the train. The Red Cross members are there to walk with them to the train. And a delightful group called the Home Guard is with them to walk with them to the train. Now, who are the home guard? As soon as we went to war, the old Confederate veterans of the town and a few non-Confederate veterans banded together and said, the young men are going to be gone. We're going to protect the home guard. So they became the home guard. And two of the men who are walking with them that day, one of them is the president of the local Confederate veterans, the other is a member, and he's the one who will carry the American flag. That's a very touching scene to me, to see those Confederate veterans so proud. And they get there early. The newspaper description was uh, to spend time, the last few hours, with these men before they're sent off to defend their country. Go to the next one. So here we are. We're back in front. Now we're going to start walking with them. So obviously, they're facing West Main, right? So they're going to turn and immediately take a ride to go down the hill to the depot. You go down North Water and, and across Town Creek and over to the depot. So what are they going to see when they make that turn to start walking? Go to the next one. A brand new store that's been there for about a year. Coons 5, 10 and 25 cent store. This picture was made in 1916, so I have to wonder if the ladies who are in this picture are still working in that store and when the men start to come, they come out and they're waving, right? Let's look at the whole street. Go to the next one. So here's North Water. The store was generally in here. 
That's what North Water looked like around 1912. This is a little bit earlier period picture. Now, Ken, you have official permission to correct me whenever I make a mistake, okay? <laughs> I, think <laughs> this is, <laughs> I think this is the Guthrie Building. It is. All right, the Guthrie Building is the name of this building. But again, I want to remind you it didn't happen in black and white. Now look very carefully at this building and at the buildings <clears throat> down the street. Now go to the next one. Same spot. Now this one was taken in 2004, but even a hundred years ago, it was a brick building. It had painted trim. It was a beautiful September day. They were not walking in black and white. Okay? So, go to the next one. So they turn, and they're walking down North Water, and the courthouse is now back here, and the very first building they see on the corner is, you cannot read it from where you are, this is obviously in 1912 or thereabouts because this is still the People's National Bank. And then there's a store, and then right over there is the First National Bank. And those of you that have read the Langley Hall book will recall that in 1915, there was a bank scandal at the First National Bank, and one of the uh, bank officers had been caught embezzling, and it was quite a scandal. And in January of 1916, the People's Bank and the First Bank merged and became the First and People's National Bank <laughs> under the direction of Mr. W.Y. Allen, who was the topic of the Langley Hall book. So by the time these men are walking down the street, that is the First and People's National Bank. It would stand until about 1925 when the building that is now there was constructed. The beautiful building, uh, sort of granite looking. Okay. So now we're going to walk down the hill and we won't see any more buildings until we get to the depot. And they get to the depot. And again, think color. Think color. Think those trees back there are still green and beginning to gold. Think that the people are wearing colorful clothing. <laughs> smell the, the, the smell in the air from the train. Um, the people are hanging out the window as they leave. The families are there to tell them goodbye. And this is not just the Sumner County draftees. On the train when it gets to Gallatin are already the Troustle County and the Macon County draftees. So we have a whole train load of drafted men who are on their way. They don't really know where. They know they'll be going first to Camp Gordon, and then they'll be disseminated wherever they're supposed to go. So as the families watch this train leave, they, never, they don't really know if they'll ever see their son, brother, husband again. They don't know. And as that train pulls out, the minister of the church across the street here Church of Christ, which then, by the way, was still called the Christian Church. It had the name Church of Christ, but it had been called the Christian Church for so long that the newspapers had a hard time changing. So we could read about things from that period. <clears throat> Olmstead, Brother Olmstead, who was the minister of the church, in the newspaper was called the, they always called him Reverend, they got that wrong too, of the Christian church. There, it was gradually, there was gradually a changeover going where the Christian church was disciples of Christ and then the other branch was churches of Christ. So it's two things. Anyway, he was there. He had a wonderful voice and he led that crowd in singing America as the train pulled away. And that was described in the Sumner County News. So just so many touching moments. Um, so we'll, 
the men then, I forget what my next thing is. Go ahead and show it. Okay. 82 men left Galveston <coughs> that day. And most of them wind up at Camp Severe in Greenville, South Carolina. I call that the most dangerous and deadly day of the war for Sumner County because from that one group of 82 men, there is a 32% casualty rate. 18 of them are wounded and eight of them will die. Overall for Sumner County, there were at least 36 wounded, so about half of them are in, are in this group right here, and uh, at least 42 who died. And when I say at least, there is no way to know for sure. The records were crazy. And a lot of the men, their service records went back to where they enlisted instead of where they were from. So you just do not know exactly how many men there were from Sumner County. The best I can estimate is there were 12 to 1400 men, black and white, all together. Roughly half of them went overseas. Okay? A lot of them would have gone, they were in the pipeline and the war ended. <laughs> so that's, that's why a lot of them did not go overseas. Okay, um, the Tennessee National Guard troop from this area had already been sent to Camp Severe and they already were going to be part of the newly created 30th Division. It turns out that all of these guys, almost all of them, go to Camp Severe and become part of the 30th. And the next group of draftees, and they go in October, are also sent to Camp Severe. So by the time the dust settles on all of this, there are more men from Sumner County in the 30th Division than in any other single division. Now we had men, we had men in the 92nd, the 93rd, the 81st, we had them all over the place. But as far as the number, there were more in the 30th Division. They had a very spe special shoulder patch. <coughs> uh, this is, oh, by the way, this is what Camp Sevier looked like maybe about a year later because when our guys got there, it hadn't been built. It happened so fast. They had to build it. And one of the, one of the infantry units, the 118th, I think it was, it had to do so much construction work that they laughed and called themselves the South Carolina Land and Development Company. <laughs> so eventually it looked like that. All right, go to the next one. This is their shoulder patch. Now I wish I could have figured out how to flip this because what I want you to do is to kind of turn your head sideways and look at it and you will see that it's an O with an H and three X's. It was supposed to be worn that way because the nickname for the 30th Division was the Old Hickory Division because it was based on the guard troops from Tennessee, North Carolina, and South Carolina, and all three of them had ties to Andrew Jackson. So they gave it the nickname, the Old Hickory, and the three X's stand for those three states. Well. You know, men have to sew their own things or get somebody else to sew them on. So when they got issued their shoulder patches, they started, they, they didn't understand the soldier patch. So it got worn the wrong way. And to this day, the 30th Division still wears that patch the wrong way. Okay. They also, before they left the country, got something else. Go to the next. Newly created and invented for World War I identification tags. They never had them in any other wars. And especially the Civil War, the trouble that they had identifying who was who after they had been killed. So they created for this war these identification tags and the boys, and it didn't matter how old they were, they were called the boys. The boys nicknamed them dog tags. So that's another thing that we got from World War I. These happen to belong to Mr. Overton Harris um, of the Liberty Community, who went off in October with the second group of draftees. All right, now go to the next. So now, let's go back to this group of men that just left, and I'm going to try 
to tell you the stories of four of them. Uh, I cannot go into too much detail because we don't have a lot of time. Now, this one you may recognize. His name is Knox Doss. And this is what he looked like when he was young. Now, what I want to do as I tell you these stories tonight is to tell you where I learned about these men. How did I get that information? Where did it come from? Well, Knox Doss was sort of easy because if you grew up in Sumner County, you know, you either went to school to him, he was either the teacher, the principal, or the superintendent of education, which is the way I, I remember him. One of my vivid high school memories is him coming on what we now call Veterans Day. It was still called Armistice Day back in the, when the dinosaurs roamed and we were in school. <laughs> you know, uh, and he spoke to an assembly at my school and described his experiences, and I never forgot them. When the war started, I met him first in the pages of the Sumner County News because he was a young man from Westmoreland who um, was from a good Westmoreland family, and he was the only teacher in a one-room school, Garrett's Creek in Westmoreland, in charge of 70 students. And he was younger than this picture <laughs> at the time. And he was often mentioned, a lot of information came from the old issues of the Sumner County News, and the best information came from those wonderful little community articles that were still there when I was growing up. Every little community that got paid by the inch so somebody would write what was going on in the community. And uh, by the time I came along, it was things like, Miss Judy White went home with Miss uh, so-and-so after church for lunch. <laughs> but when World War I came around, there were serious things. And all of those wonderful little community news columns told who was leaving, who was sick, what was happening. And I got some of the best stories for the book from those columns. And he was quite often mentioned in the Westmoreland News. As a matter of fact, the summer of 1917, there was a wonderful little section about his wedding to a young lady who was a teacher at the high school there in Westmoreland. And it just described it in such glowing terms and what a wonderful young lady she was and what a dependable young man he was. So he had registered for the draft on June 5th. He had gotten married three days later on June 8th. And three months later, he was drafted and being sent off to Camp Severe. <coughs> uh, go to the next picture. At Camp Severe, <clears throat> he was put in the 105th Engineers. Now, I can't prove this, but I think the men who were sorting these guys as they came through could tell who was smart and who wasn't and who would get into something that required some particular knowledge and who could just be what the British called in this war the PB, the PBI. The, he's just in the PBI and that's the poor bloody infantry because the infantry was going to have to do the hard slogging work through the gas and through the mud. But obviously he was an educated young man and he was put in the 105th engineers and they did all kinds of things and they started by practicing building these things at Camp Severe so they had to dig trenches, uh, dig the trenches for the soldiers. They had to, to build bridges. Um, they had to do all kinds of engineer type things. And this is part of his company at Camp Severe and of course that's him with the circle around him. Now he had quite a few adventures in the war. I've, I've tried to talk about them all in the book. One that I do remember particularly, the 30th Division was in three major battles. And in the third battle, his platoon of, of the engineers had come to a bridge and they were trying to figure out what they would do. He had just been talking to two of his friends and had just stepped away when they heard a whiz. And it was actually what they called a whiz bang. It was a shell and it went faster than the speed of sound. 
So by the time they heard the whiz, the shell was there and immediately it exploded. So they called it a whiz bang. And he had just stepped away from where those two men were standing and they were hit by the shell and killed. And he never forgot that. And I have been told by people who went to school to him that he told that story often. Um, he had a lot of other adventures. Where did I get the information about him? Well, to begin with, other than the Sumner County News, there were some re records, excuse me, put together in the 1930s. I think it was probably a WPA project in which they tried to compile county by county in Tennessee all of the service records that they could find of World War I soldiers. Of course, then it was still called the Great War or the World War. They didn't know we were going to have a two coming along. Now, those records are at the State Library and Archives. They have digitized parts of it, but there's a whole lot more information than what you find on the website. So you really have to go back to the original records. And you also have to be very careful with them. And I guess I was lucky that I grew up in Sumner County. So when I would see a community that I never heard of, I know I called Ken a couple of times, but I also learned because I spent a lot of time traveling for the state and going to all the school systems around the state, uh, I ran into a list of about five men who lived in Peabody. Well, fortunately, I knew Peabody was in West Tennessee, so I knew they were not Sumner County men. So you had to be really careful with those records. But the best information came from two books that were put out after the war. Each of the divisions, and within the divisions, many of the regiments put out histories of the experience of their own division. So there was a history of the 30th Division, and then there was a history of the 105th Engineers that went day by day, from the time they got to Camp Severe until the war was over and they were back. And fortunately, there's a story behind this, but I was able to get Mr. Doss's own copy of the history of the 105th, and he had gone through and underlined everything that he had to do, and he had written notes in the margins. One of the sweetest things was early on when they got to Camp Severe or touching things, uh, one of his buddies uh, had died of disease. You bring together 30,000 men in a time when they didn't have antibiotics, they did have antiseptics, but they didn't have medicines to control. They didn't have aspirin. The only thing they had for pain was morphine. The only thing they had to put you to sleep with was ether. It was not a really good time, um, better than the Civil War, but not as good as it would become. And it was just rife for contagious disease to break out. And the first death Sumner County had was a young man who had been sent in October. He'd been at camp two weeks, and he got, I think it was typhoid, mm -hmm. died of typhoid. Well, one of his buddies had died of typhoid. And in the margin of his book, he had written, I was one of the pallbearers. We put the body on the train at midnight as the company bugler stood in the door and played. Can you just imagine that? So I was very lucky to learn a lot about Mr. Doss. Well, let's go to somebody else. Now, I'm getting tired of this picture, but while I can tell you the name of every man who's standing there, because they were printed in the Sumner County News, who was leaving, they were not matched up to this picture. This picture was not in the Sumner County News. So we really only know very few of exactly who these men are. I don't know which one's Mr. Doss, for example. But I do know who this guy is right there. 
Go to the next one. His name is John Henry Adcock. He's from Bethpage. And I know all about him. First, again, I met him in the pages of the Sumner County News. Because back then, young men who didn't have a lot of opportunities, maybe their families were poor, maybe they wanted to better themselves somehow or other, would do what we call go north. So they would go, for example, to Dearborn, Michigan, or to Detroit. <clears throat> he went to Indianapolis. They would go to the mines of Pennsylvania, any place in the north where there were more opportunities for guys who didn't have as much opportunity here. They would go and work. Actually, the northern part of our, our uh, county, for more than one reason, at one point were called the Ridge Runners because so many people worked up north and they would manage to come home whenever they could, so they were running the ridge <laughs> all the time. So Johnny, they called him Johnny, was in Indianapolis when we joined the war and when they passed the Selective Service Act. I think he was making 25 cents a day working for the l &N Railroad. Um, so he came home. All of the boys who didn't live in Sumner County, when they were required to register for the draft, a lot of them just went ahead and enlisted where they were, but uh, uh, they just flooded back home. They all came home so that they could enlist back home in Tennessee. And that's what Johnny Adcock did. So he was one of these draftees, and he got sent off to Camp Severe. Go to the next picture. Now this is his service picture. And I can tell you that it's a genuine one, but I can tell you also that it was made much later. This one was, had to be made after he was in the war for a couple of reasons. You can see his shoulder patch, and he was a private. These are service um, stripes, and you got one, one stripe for every so long that you were in the service. And there was a cartoon that we printed in the book uh, where after the war was over, the men were tr waiting to come home, and they thought they'd never get to come home, and so the cartoon, they had this long beard, and I didn't notice it when we put it in, but the other dads looking at it, they've got these stripes all the way down their arms and their legs because they're still waiting to go home, so they're getting these stripes for every six months or so, whatever. So anyway, um, he will live to be 102 years old, and he will be the oldest surviving member or, or veteran of Sumner County not everywhere, but Sumner County in the war. His, because he lived so long, his daughter Cornelia Masters, I don't know if any of you know Cornelia, uh, was able to get a lot of information from him. Because for the most part, as veterans with just about any war, he didn't want to talk about it when he came back. As a matter of fact, he told Cornelia that what they had to go through over there was so horrible that he and his friends, they just decided nobody would believe it. So they just weren't going to talk about it. I've told a lot of his story in the book, um, but one that I, that I will tell because I think it's kind of funny. Go to the next page. When he left that day, the last words he said to his family were, I'll be home when it's over. <laughs> so on October 7th or 8th, 1918, he's in the middle of a battle. Now his job, he was with the headquarters company of the 117th Infantry. So his job was to keep the different uh, headquarters of each company in communication with each other. So he had to string the wires. They were following along behind the infantry and he had to go and keep all the communication equipment. So he described to his daughter how he would have to step over the dead bodies and wade through the battlefield and, and how horrible it was. Well, in early October, he was gassed. He ran into some gas. If the gas experience was not too bad, it usually took a soldier two weeks to get back to duty. So when they brought him in and they examined him, and they could do x-rays by this time. 
they saw this terrible stuff in his chest. And they said, oh, oh no, this is bad. We're going to send you back and you're going to be headed back home. And he said, no, no. I said, I was going to stay till it was over. <laughs> Why do you want to keep me? Why do you want to send me back? And they said, well, we see this in your chest. And he said, oh, no, no, no. You look at it again, and you will see that it looks like a horseshoe because I was kicked by a mule when I was a kid. <laughs> so they went back and looked, and sure enough, it was the shape of the, uh, the mules. <laughs> so he got to stay. And what was good about him getting to stay was that on Armistice Day, because remember, he was at headquarters company, he was on the radio on duty when the word, the official word, came through that the armistice had been signed and he, and the war was over, that the hostilities were ceasing. So he told them he wasn't going to be back until it was over. Okay, let's go to, now I don't have any pictures for this guy, this is one of my favorite stories, and it's because I had so much trouble finding the story, I think. Um, I told you that one of my main sources was, and by the way, my main source for Johnny Adcock was all the stories he told his daughter, and she shared them all with me, and she had written it up. Okay, well, all I had with this guy was his service record, in the, in, in the documents that were at the State Library and Archives. And I could not find anything else about him. One of the reasons I eventually found out is because they had written his name not as Brizendine, but as Brozendine. <laughs> and his father, who was <coughs> listed as next of kin <coughs> contact, was listed as Brazendine. With an A. Well, I couldn't find anything about him. So I did, I, talking to Ken and talking to, you know, I realized I needed to play around with his name. I had decided it was misspelled. So I finally found him, and what I found was his draft registration card. And that gave me two vital pieces of information. The first was that he signed it with an X, and then someone wrote his mark. What that told me was he was illiterate, and he was 25 years old at the time, nearly 25. He was illiterate. I was able, once I found his real name, and I'll come back to the other piece of information that was on his draft card but I was able to locate him in a couple of censuses, and I was able to figure out that he was from a family of what we always called sharecroppers, tenant farmers, and they moved around. And in his particular case, they moved between Simpson County, Kentucky, and the northern part of Sumner County. So he was from a very poor, uneducated family. The other thing that I found from his draft registration card, there was a place where you had to sign or, or give the information, your place of residence when you registered. In jail. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, now I had a mystery, and that's what motivates me with these. So I went to the archives, to our local archives, and I asked dear Randy Tatum, whom we worked to death, and he has retired now, I understand. <laughs> Randy, is there any way I could find out why somebody was in jail, in the Sumner County Jail, in 1917? <laughs> he said, well, I guess we could get the court records, and I go, duh, <laughs> of course. So he goes back and pulls out the court records. I think it was the circuit court. I'm not very good with those labels. And I go to 1916 and 17, and I hit a gold mine. <laughs> because this poor guy and his poor family, and it's 100 years later, it's funny in retrospect, but you put yourself there, it's very sad. Because he and his brother and his father were constantly 
in trouble with the law. Now, Al's particular problem was selling liquor, and Tennessee had just gone bone dry. His brother not only was in trouble for selling liquor, but he had a little bit of a gambling problem. They called it gaming. His father, I think, had a little bit of it all, but he even had a charge, and my, my imagination goes crazy with this. For he, he was charged and, and um, tried for disturbing worship. <laughs> now, what I have determined, because this name kept ringing a bell with me, it just kept ringing a bell with me, and I finally figured out where I had seen it when I was going through the cemetery book, because another of my sources was the Sumner County Cemetery book. I went through that thing page by page by page looking for anybody that had on their headstone that they had been in World War I. And I found him. And I found him in the cemetery of my home church. <laughs> Where I grew up, I've got five generations of my family. It's a little country church out in South Tunnel, Bush's Chapel Church of Christ. And I had grown up seeing that man's headstone and it just never, the two had never gone together. Are you sure there's no relation? <laughs> Be that as it may, <laughs> I was then able to go back. Uh, my, my, one of my good friend's husband has all the church records. She was able to go back, and we were able to determine that, yes, at that period of time, there was a Brizendine family that went there. Now, it was very common for women to be very pious these men who lived in poverty and illiteracy and hopelessness, they did anything they could to either make money or relieve the stress. And it was a very shameful thing for the women of the family. It was very hard. So poor Al, at the time he registered, was in the Sumner County workhouse. And he had had a jury trial. And this, is, this also speaks to the poverty. He had pled not guilty to the sauce, <laughs> and they had found him guilty anyway. I'm quite sure he didn't have a lawyer. And they had sentenced him to a certain amount of time in the workhouse, and then there were the court costs that had to be paid. So the sheriff went to his home to seize anything of value that could be taken to pay for the court costs. And he had to come back and declare nulla bono, which means there was nothing. These people were very poor. And so Al was drafted while he was in the workhouse. He got out of the workhouse the week before. He still had three charges pending that he had to go to court for as soon as he got out of the workhouse because he had to work off not only his time but the court fees. So the county magnanimously dropped the charges and agreed to, uh, you know, suspend the court costs because they were going to be to a greater advantage to use him to fill their quota of draftees than to keep him around in the, in the Sumner County workhouse. So he went off, he went to, to camp, no, we're back. We're back. We're back. Yeah. I told you there were three major battles that the 30th Division was in. The very first battle, the night before it was supposed to start, when they were coming into the lines, he was killed in action. So he died almost a year to the day they left Gallatin on September 21st. He was killed on September 24th of 1918. Now, Knox Doss's wife got to come and visit him at the camp. And when he got a leave, he came home to visit her at Christmas. The next guy that we're going to see had visitors. Al Brizendine didn't have any money. His family couldn't afford to go to South Carolina to visit him. 
He couldn't afford to come home, if, even if he got a, a, a leave. So he had not seen his family, and he left. And I think it speaks a couple of things. I, did, I, I, put, I like to put together numbers and see what they show me. Al had left home in 1917 in September. In December, his brother Will had died. He's buried at the Bush's Chapel Cemetery. He has no headstone. Back in the day, poor families couldn't afford a headstone. They would put a rock to mark the grave. And as long as anybody was alive to remember who was buried there, that person was remembered. Once everybody was gone, it was just a rock. And people come to mow these old cemeteries and move those rocks out of the way. And those were the headstones from that day. So he died in 1918, but his body didn't get to come home. It took a while. So 1920, well, in 1919, Mrs. Mary Elizabeth Brizendine passed away. She was elderly. I don't exactly know the relationship. Maybe an aunt, maybe a grandmother. She was 77. She had her funeral at Bush's Chapel. She was buried in the Southern County, in the Bush's Chapel Cemetery. No headstone. And she had died in the Sumner County Poorhouse. Mm -hmm. And that was, I think, in Cottontown. <coughs> 1920, Al's body gets brought home. The government bought every man who died in the war a headstone. Mm -hmm. And from that day forward, they still do. Okay. But another thing, and I like, I can't prove this, I just like to speculate on this. The soldiers, when they went to camp, had the opportunity, and they all did it, to assign a portion of what they would be paid to pay for a $10,000 life insurance policy. As a matter of fact, there's a very poignant scene. Uh, I read a book called The Doughboys that um, a man who'd lost his leg in the war described because uh, General Pershing, who was the commander of all the troops, mandated that anybody that died in a hospital would get full military honors when they came to take the body out from the hospital. And so it was sort of like gallows humor. But the other guys, when they would see their buddies being taken out with a band playing, and they usually were playing the funeral march. Dum, dum, da, dum, dum. So the other men in the hospital would sing, $10,000 for the family back home. That was the only good thing that they could think of. Well, I like to speculate. That poor Al Brizendine, when he died, left $10,000 to a family for whom it would have been a fortune. Because in 1920, another lady, Betty Hunter Brizendine, passed away and was buried at Sumner County, uh, Bush Chapel Cemetery. She has a headstone. Mm -hmm. And every other Brizendine, there are four or five more over the next... 10, 20 years, they all have headstones. Mm -hmm. So I like to think that Al's death mm -hmm. meant something. Okay, one more guy, mm -hmm. and I'll have to hurry. I know my time is up, or getting there. I met this young man in the pages of the Sumner County News in 1916 when he was taking Miss Catherine Brown, his girlfriend, to a dance at the Epperson Springs near Westmoreland. That was as popular as Red Boiling Springs at the time. And it was very common for the young society people of Gallatin to go to dances at um, Epperson Springs. So obviously by that indication that he was listed in the society pages of the Sumner County News, he's from the upper crust. His name is John Trimble Alexander. He also left that day with the draftees. 
His mother came to visit him at camp. His girlfriend came to visit him at camp. His mother even came, got to come again before they shipped out to go overseas. And she was very glad she did because he, survived. he was in the 114th Machine Gun Battalion, part of the 70th Division. He survived all of three of the major battles. Gloriously through Armistice Day, 1918, and on Christmas Eve, 1918, he died of the flu. Mm -hmm. The great, I don't have time to go into it, but one of the big stories of this period of time, I could just talk, you know, hours and hours and hours on all these different things. But the flu, the great flu epidemic. So he died, and there were so many dying, they had to build emergency cemeteries. Now, they had to do that at the battlefields because they had so many uh, bodies that they had to deal with after the battles. It took them three days to bury the dead bodies after the first battle that the 30th Division was in. But these men were dying back in hospitals. They were dying in the port cities. Go to the next picture. So here we have a whole cemetery, and this is actually his grave, although they've got his middle initial wrong. This is where he was buried right after he died. Then he was brought back, and he's in the Gallatin Cemetery now. Go to the next picture. This man right, I think it's this man right here, one of those two, is a guy from Portland. This was from his photograph collection. This is his platoon, and they are digging mass graves in Brest because so many men are dying so fast of the flu that they just have to, to, to get them buried. And this is in Brest. This is in the port city, not where the battles were taking place. So it was a terrible thing. Go to the next frame. It was called a pandemic because it went around the world. I had intended to tell you the story of a couple of our, our groups that were drafted and were on the infected ships. And by the time they got overseas, they were already sick. Um, I, will, I will throw this in. Of the African-American soldiers in World War I, we only had four deaths. One was actually after the war was over. He never got overseas. It happened in camp. But the three that actually died over, overseas had been infected on the ship as they went over, and they all died as a result of the flu. Okay, so this was the great flu pandemic, but it didn't just affect the soldiers right here in Sumner County. All the doctors were gone with the troops, so there weren't enough doctors. And the ones that were, they got the flu too. It was a horrible time, and just in the month of October, now this doesn't sound like a lot, but you consider that we had 42 men who died, more or less, who died in the war. In the month of October alone, 67 people died in Sumner County of the flu, and that's just one month. So it was horrible. Well, let's go. We're coming to the end. Go to the next. Armistice Day, November 11, 1918, the war was over, much elation, much jubilation, and eventually, no matter how long they had to wait, they finally made it home. In Nashville, they built a temporary victory arch, and all of the units of the 30th Division, because remember, that was Tennessee's division, all of our guard troops and so many of our draftees. Now, we had men in all the other divisions, too, but the 30th was special. So when the 117th Infantry got back to town, when the 114th Machine Gun, when the 115th Field Artillery, when they, they would each come separately, they were whole regiments, they'd arrive at Union Station, and they would march through that victory arch right to the Capitol building. And then they would get to come home. So that's what happened. Everyone was, was very happy. Let's go on. But I do want to share one little, one little thing. Um, the American Battle Monuments Commission was created. This is a legacy that we got from World War I. 
and their website, and I urge everybody to go to this website, you will see wonderful things. It's A, American Battle Monuments Commission, ABMC.gov. It's a government agency, ABMC.gov. They are responsible for all of the military cemeteries around the world that didn't exist until after World War I. And they went back and they built monuments. This is the monument to the Battle of Bellecourt, which was the first battle that the 30th Division was in. But they not only built monuments to the battles, go to the next picture, they built the, Amer the cemeteries. Now the government would bring home anybody that the fam if the family wanted the body brought home, they would bring it home. There were various reasons that some families did not want the body brought home. They wanted them to rest where they were. And so we have these cemeteries. If you've ever been to Normandy, that's one of them. This is one of the World War I cemeteries. The Somme American Cemetery. All three battles that the 30th Division was in <coughs> were part of what was called the Somme Offensive. They fought with the British. They were not part of the Battle of the Meuse-Argonne. They were at a different point on the line. So I love what the, the monument says at the top, Mort pour la patrie, which says, dead for the fatherland. They are still honored by the French today. Go to the next one. This is what the graves there look like. You can see that monument that we just saw back there. Two more guys that left. There are others. They got to come back. But two of the guys that left that day, September 21st, 1917, didn't get to come back. One of them, go to the next picture, is Walter Morgan from Portland, no connection. So go to the next one. That's his headstone there at the Somme American Cemetery. Go to one more. You can't really read it. This one is Herbert Upchurch, who also left that day. I just don't have his picture. He was from Cottontail. And their bodies are still there. We still have, uh, we have one guy that's buried at the Brookwood American Cemetery from World War I in England. And we have three, I think, who are buried at the Muse Argonne. So some of the Sumner County men didn't get to come home. All right. Let's go quickly through the end. I don't have time to go through this. Go to the next. All these stories are just forgotten. And as they used to say, lest we forget, I think that's the reason I wrote this book. Because we need to remember. We need to remember, and it's been 100 years. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd be happy to answer any questions, or I hope I haven't talked too long. Any questions? Thank you for Thank having, you. for letting us remember. Okay. Us well, remember. hi, Jimmy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I was different. It wasn't the same. So. All right. Well, thank you for having me.